Welcome to the CMO Spotlight, and I am here with Laura Goldberg, who's the Chief Marketing Officer for Constant Contact. Welcome, Laura. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. I'm so excited to have this conversation with you today. And I wonder if we could just start off by you telling us a little bit more about Constant Contact, the company. Sure. So Constant Contact is an email, digital marketing, and CRM platform for small businesses. So we try and help small businesses grow, reach more customers, um, and uh, reach their goals. Great. And so tell us a little bit about your role as chief marketing officer. Maybe tell us about your role, your team, that kind of thing. Yep. So I'm the chief marketing officer. I have uh, sort of an atypical um, team in that uh, at some companies I might be called a CRO, but we're not really an enterprise company. So I own marketing. So marketing for me is uh, a, you know, customer growth team, acquisition, um, customer lifecycle management, uh, and a channel team. And then I have a sort of traditional head of brand who runs brand, creative, content, uh, product marketing team. And then um, uh, PR, and then lastly, I, I call them the O's, operations um, and optimizations, right? So they run the website, they run the MarTech stack, they're looking at optimizely and other things to improve our stack. And then on the other side, I run the sales organization. So that is largely a telesales um, rep that really works what comes in to trial to our um, to our product. So it's sales, sales enablement, sales ops, um, and then a BDR and AE team. Wow. Okay. So that's it's interesting for organizations that have a leader that is responsible for both marketing and sales because sometimes there's tension between sales and marketing. And I think when there's a single leader owning both, there's a lot less tension usually. Yes. And I think because of the way our um, sales motion works, where there's sort of media, which drives to a website that gets a, um, you know, a lead who can convert with it, with or without that salesperson, it's a little more symbiotic than, you know, when you have a rep who's doing outbound and inbound and it's like, what's, you know, where's the pull and push and pull there? Mm -hmm. Well, I wondered if you could tell us a little bit about your career path. You had a very interesting career path. I saw you an undergrad to Carnegie Mellon and then Harvard MBA, but then you, I saw a stop at Napster along the way there, for example. And then I know most recently you were with a company called Cabbage that was acquired by American Express. So I Correct. wonder if you could just give us the, the nickel tour of your career path. I will give you the nickel tour. Uh, there's definitely like a quarter tour and like a hundred dollar tour because I've had <laughs> um, sort of an interesting career path. Yes, I went to Carnegie Mellon undergrad um, and Harvard Business School and, and you know, started my career in the traditional places, um, consulting and finance. And I got a great base of sort of general education, but didn't didn't love it, right? Really wanted to be an operator I, is sort of the bigger word. And so in um, the beginning of the 2000s, I uh, joined the digital music revolution and, and music was sort of the first media to get online, right? Small files, easy to digitize. And, you know, Napster, the free version already <laughs> existed. And so I spent 10 years and, and that's where I like to say I got my internet education learning about technology, learning about marketing, which was very different than um, learning about customer support and tech support and all that, all that good stuff, trying to make, uh, trying to make what is basically uh, iTunes and Spotify today. Mm -hmm. um, and so I started working for Universal Music, but there were a lot of antitrust issues spun out. And we actually bought the Napster name and some of the IP um, and and um, the technology out of bankruptcy. So whole could be a whole nother podcast about wow. that journey, but bought that out of um, bankruptcy. And I would say like my first marketing challenge, and I was the chief operating officer at the time and had marketing, but you know, my first marketing challenge was how do you take 
this beloved brand Napster, right? Like right. I, I could see your eyes light up when you said yeah. it. Um, you know, it was beloved, but it was beloved because you didn't have to pay for music. <laughs> right, 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 right. For the wrong press. reasons, right. Right. right, right. You loved it was cool, right? So the right. Cool, and so how do you keep what's cool and what's music and all of that, but then say, hey, we want you to pay 10 bucks a month for yeah. access to all this music. And and I would say we were mildly successful. <laughs> um and you know, the brand still exists today. I actually saw that uh, Napster just made an acquisition there very much in the web three uh, uh, world, but it was super interesting and just a really fun journey. Um, Napster eventually got sold, which seems strange now, it made sense at the time, to Best Buy. Mm-hmm. Um, and that was not a place I wanted to be. And um you know, I'm going to hand wave this part of my career, but had a number of product marketing COO roles in smaller, more startup um, size companies. Oh, I, I, I let, I list, I I skipped one sexy stuff that people, that people generally like. Um, um, I went after the music industry, I went to the NFL for a while and Mm -hmm, was the mm -hmm, general manager of essentially the NFL online. And, and that was interesting. It was a just a, an amazing education for me, for someone who had always run marketing, but more from a performance point of view, to work for this company that really took its brand seriously, right? We, you know, it's referred to as the shield and what will you put the shield next to and how, and, and seeing use guidelines and values and and how really empowering and how powerful that brand was. Now, agree or disagree with some of the things that the NFL stands for it. It's very strong in knowing who they were. And it was an amazing education in seeing the power of a brand and what a brand could really do, especially for someone like me, who is definitely viewed as more operational and much more steeped in the numbers, right? Mm-hmm. Is Are we getting the ROI on that? Is this working for us? So um, after the NFL, like I said, I went to a bunch of smaller companies in a variety of roles. And then um, one holiday season, a friend from the music industry called and said, I am at LegalZoom and we need a CMO. And I mm-hmm. said, I'm not sure I know anyone. And he's like, no, no, I'm calling you because I want you to be the CMO. And I was like, I'm not a CMO. I've never had a marketing title, <laughs> right? I've had product and operations and general manager, but like, why do you want me? And he said, you know, we are a company of lawyers because it's a legal product and engineers. And we need someone who thinks about the customer first. What are we offering to the customer? And he's like, we're good at SEM and some of these other like tactical things. Can you come? And so I went there and I mentioned it and it's very pivotal for me because it started what's now been almost a 10 year journey working for companies that cater to small businesses, which is yep. something yep. if you had told me before, I wouldn't have known I had a passion for, but is I find incredibly rewarding. And so I spent five years at LegalZoom, um, ran marketing. I I, uh, GM'd some other businesses that were there. And in that five-year period, we doubled revenue. We increased EBITDA fivefold um, and really set the groundwork for them to go public, which they did a couple of years ago. And then when I left there, I went to Cabbage, as you mentioned, Mm -hmm. which was you know, a bit of a continuation, like doing small business lending, right? So right in that same sweet spot of customer. And what I like about that is it's where the sales part comes in. They're people, right? The person who runs your dry cleaner or, or owns your yoga studio or walks your dog or runs the daycare, they're just people, right? Mm-hmm. And they, and, and that's how I believe small business marketing should work, right? How you would talk to them, how you would treat them, but they are businesses, right? So they're thinking about how they're making payroll and how they're growing and how their customers are doing. And that's where the sales component comes in. And so it makes it really exciting 
to be able to have sort of media, but also that human touch, right? We're here for you. We know that you'd rather make that uh, cookie or whatever mm -hmm. it is and not like develop a promotional email. So we're here to help you do that. Um, and, and that's sort of the through line, if you will, between LegalZoom, then Cabbage, and now Constant Contact. They all they all really have um, that through line. So I'll pause there because- um, Yeah. Well, my, my uh, younger brother is a drummer in Nashville, Tennessee. He's a musician and he teaches and he's a big Constant Contact customer. And he relies it. heavily on Constant Contact to be able to communicate with his current um, students and potential students and all of that. So anyway, your product is well used, um, you know, in, in my family even. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Um, so I'm curious if there's a piece of advice that you either wish you had gotten earlier in your career, or maybe you would give to somebody that's a little younger in their marketing career. Um, uh, don't worry so much. It's probably the, uh, it, though easier, uh, Easier said than done. And also like it's a marathon, not a sprint. And I think um, I, my career didn't end up the way it did through um, any sort of like maniacal planning. But I, I think one of the things that worked for me and that I give people as advice is if something feels wrong to you, it's wrong. It doesn't mm -hmm. matter what the money is. You can rationalize anything. And, and mm -hmm. I would say every time I took a job where the thing at the top of that list was compensation, it never worked out, right? It wasn't, it wasn't the right thing. It's, it, it's always about, you know, are, are the people, people you want to talk to, hang out with every day, is the company doing something that resonates with you. And it doesn't have to be like, you know, we're not curing cancer, right? And But, you know, helping small businesses, doing, you know, doing something that makes you, that gives you pride. That's the way I'll yeah. say it. That gives you That's pride. That's a great way to say it. And then three, oh. you know, there has to be the right risk reward. Are you killing yourself for, for the right thing or not the right thing. And so that's, I, I think the, that advice, if I had gotten that advice earlier and I like to give that advice, like when thinking about why you are where you are and where you should, should be, whether you should take that next role or not, those are the things that I like to tell people to think about. Great. I love it. So I believe that everybody has a superpower. And so I'm curious what you've been told your superpower is. Um, it's funny. I have my mom's superpower, which when my kid, my kids are grown ish. Um, but when they were little, um, they slept, which, um, was, I guess a superpower. Like they would sleep past seven. They slept through the night. I was like, yay, I've done something right. So getting kids to sleep was my, uh, personal, <laughs> was my superpower there. Um, I, well, I'm going to laugh because something happened today. I'm very good at back of the envelope math. Mm. I can get like within numbers, uh, no substitute. I don't even want it for a minute. No substitute for deep and uh, meaningful and, and impactful analysis. But <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm pretty good at, um, I don't know if it's a superpower, but uh, that sort of quick, quick analysis. It it is because if you think about as a leader, you have to make sometimes make some decisions that will impact the business and people. And often those decisions are made on, you know, is this going to work out profitably for us? And is it going to make sense for our business? And so I think that is a superpower for sure. Awesome. Yeah. Um, so I'm curious if there are some values that you either want to demonstrate as a leader or maybe values that you demand from somebody that would work on your team. I, and I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't normally do this, um, but it's actually interesting. So when I got to, con so Constant Contact has had a journey as a company, right? It was a start, you know, it was a pioneer in its space, started, you know, yeah. in a garage in Boston you know, in the middle of the nineties, right? So, which is ancient for an online company. Oh yeah. Um, 
and then they went public and then they were acquired and then they were divested. And one of the first things we did when we got there, I promise I'm gonna answer your question. Um, when we got there was, you know, what is the brand? And, 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 you know, not a top down. It's like when I talk to the people who've been here and who were here during different ownership structures and whatever, what comes through and what's, what's there? And, and as I think about it, why did I come here, right? And so we just redid our values and and I don't want to say they're reflective of me because they're not. They're very much reflective of constant contact, but they're why I'm at constant contact. And so they're definitely what I demand of, of my people. And, and there's a couple which really resonate. So one is customers are a constant. We are here to provide a product to our customers. And no matter what, we should put them first, right? And so that's really important to me. The second one is the words we use are adapt and act for impact. And I I always talk about a bias towards action, right? What do you is what you're doing affect, you know, getting us towards where we're where we need to be? Is it impactful? Is it, can you see the difference? Like make sure you're prioritizing work that way. And by the way, you're not, the action you take is not always gonna be right. Great, learn from it and adapt. And that's why those two things together um, really work. And, you know, the last one, I, um, I care a lot about integrity and 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 truth and all of that and and I I think this organization does too our CEO very much does and so the last one is um, we what we say is keep it real do it right like <laughs> be honest about what's going on do the right thing and that will always lead to goodness and you know it's much easier to deliver bad news in the moment than to like stew on it and wait. And that, by the way, is always the right thing. Or if you're not, mm -hmm. it's it's before about if if a job doesn't feel right in your gut, it's probably not right, right? Do just do the right thing. So those are a few things that you know are really important to me that also happen to be reflected in the constant contact values that I look for in my people. I love that. Um, so. At setup, we're marketing matchmakers, and that often means that we connect brands and marketing agencies together. And we sort of live in that space in between. So we're not a not an agency. We're not on the client side. We live in that space between. But we think a lot about the relationship between brands and agencies. I'm curious, just generally, how you work with agencies, either a constant contact or maybe in a previous life. Um. Inter so I would say it's actually interesting. I um I was thinking about this connection, this um question, because my gut is as little as possible, but that's not true. And I actually think um something that you're that you talk about resonates here, which is I use agencies to fill in gaps. Mm. And and those gaps may be gaps in expertise, maybe gaps in hiring for a moment. It, it's, um, I'll, I'll give you one example. Like I've never had an in-house creative team that's making ad, right television ads. Like that is someplace where an agency, uh, a partner is really efficient for getting something done that you have to do maybe once or twice a year super impactful, right? Really important, expensive, but um, <clears throat> really, really meaningful. I would say a couple other places, um, buying television, right? I'm never going to be able to negotiate with NBC better right. than an agency who's aggregating bigger brands, right? So that's, that is one place I've always used an agency is media, TV, TV, um, you know, online over the top, et cetera um media buying and then everywhere else is really filling in filling in a gap um you know we used uh 
I, I laugh at them. I'm like, you're my brand agency. It's like three people, um, <laughs> but they're really great. And, and they're, you know, if you're looking to revitalize or hone, like those words I gave, I gave you before about value, like I said, those were there, but you need help coming, teasing yeah. them out. Just and sometimes, them. yeah. Yeah. And sometimes it's easier to tell them to a third party than it is to your CMO or the head of brand or whatever that is. So that's really how I use agencies. I, where things are important, I think it's important to build capabilities. I've never had a lot of luck with someone doing SEM for me or um, some other things, but that's sort of where, um, where, where we use it to fill holes, to enhance. Um, I, I think the right way, the right way for yeah. me. Well, we, we often talk about in our business that the gaps that exist are either capacity gaps where you just don't have enough arms and legs to do the things you're trying to accomplish or their capability gaps where, it, to your point, it doesn't make sense to have a specialist that's super focused on a specific niche of marketing. You, you generally staff your marketing team with generalists that can do lots of different things, but that means that they're not by nature, not great at everything. There are certain disciplines where having an outside perspective or expert that lives and breathes this stuff all day, every day is, is beneficial. Agreed. Agreed. Yeah. So uh, as marketers, we often work with the non-marketing functions of, within the company. And you have a little bit unique role in that you own business development or, or sales you know, and, and have revenue responsibility beyond just yeah. marketing responsibility. But I'm curious how you generally demonstrate the value of marketing to non-marketers that don't live in that world. Um, so I live and die by an LTV to CAC ratio almost all can the you time. Just, so, can you tell to, for yes. the audience, can you tell what those are? I was, yes, I, I, I was going there next. So okay. LTV is long-term value, lifetime value of a customer. So how much revenue last the cost of goods, cost of service, et cetera, divided by the cost to acquire that customer. Right. And in general, your that ratio should be over three. Three is sort of, you're doing okay. I once hit a six and I actually had an investor say, can you spend more money? Yeah. Right? That's where you're in a really good situation. But that is something I um, I like to look at. We um, I like to look at it as stripped down as possible, that CAC. And my CFO likes to look at it as built up as possible. <laughs> I think the harder part of that is how do you look at my creative team, my brand team, right? Parts of the team, which are lifting all the boats, right? That is sometimes a little harder to um, delineate. And, and so, and, and, you know, last year where we did a new visual identity and, and things like that, people see it, right? The website looks totally different Then you're like, oh yeah, this looks better and right. things are better, but it's hard in the day in and day out. But I think that, you know, I try and run as lean as we need to be um, and and really show that value. But when I, I, I will say the a little bit of the through line between uh, legal zoom, not so much cabbage, but a little bit, and um, constant contact is they're all private equity backed. And mm -hmm. so, you know, you really need to show the numbers, right? I always, um, someone asked me how I lasted so long working for PE at LegalZoom. And I said, because I show the numbers first and the pretty pictures second. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I think being, we're, we're a numbers business, um, all, you know, all, all three, Cabbage, LegalZoom and Constant Contact, we're all about LTV to CAC, about you know churn, net revenue retention, things like that. We're very analytically, and I am very analytically focused. Great. So I'm curious if there's a campaign, either again at Constant Contact or in a previous life, that taught you a really important lesson, either because it was a miserable failure and you needed to learn that valuable lesson, or it was a success that maybe you'd like to try to emulate again in the future. Um. 
something sort of sort of old in my past sticks in my head. But um, uh, when I was at the NFL, uh, one of the things that's a bummer is after week, well, now 18, but it used to be 17. <laughs> right. Fantasy football's done, right? Right, you're right. And uh, it, you know, there's a little bit of lull between that and the Super Bowl. And a lot of people are interested in the NFL for their fantasy football games. And so um, we had a game that was like sort of in the playoffs and it was a really cool game. And we had developed an ad, I think before I got there, maybe the year I got there with them. Um, do you remember that song, uh, Had a Bad Day? Oh, yeah, of course. And um, I could like sing it. And the ad, I you, think- You should. You should sing it. I'm not going to sing it. Um, <laughs> but uh, I think I saw it this year. So I was at the NFL in, in around 2000, uh, around 2010, 2009 and 10. And every year we would, the ad is basically, so you had a bad day and it would be people just lamenting their fantasy football season. Yeah. But then you had an opportunity to do it all over again for the this fantasy game during the playoffs. And every year... We talked about what's the new ad for that game, which was a great game. It kept people engaged. We were really trying to drive engagement on the website, not on Sunday, right? So right. for you to come. And every year it was like, we can't do any better, right? And we re would relicense the song and like run that ad back for another <laughs> two weeks. And I guess my point in all of that is like, don't overthink things. Like if something is working, great. Like, yeah. can you just reuse it? Can you double down on it? Can you maybe extend it? Um, you know, because there's, uh, there's some simplicity in that. Absolutely. Um, all right. So I want to wrap things up with some fun kind of rapid fire questions that really aren't marketing specific. The first is, is there a sports team or a quote, or a book, or a movie, or a band, you know, that, that really inspires you? And what is it about that thing that inspires you most? Ugh, you don't want to talk about sports with me. I'm from Boston, and people think we're obnoxious. Um, no, just to I, say, I, I, born in Boston, and, and all my extended family is there, and grew up Pats, Celtics, Bruins, Patriots, so I understand. Yep. Um, Red Sox. Sorry, <laughs> I missed Sox. You missed the Sox, right. I, it's the funny. most important, we were, uh, yeah. Yeah, it's uh, it's funny though. When I was a kid, except for the Celtics, all of those teams stunk, and yeah. uh, it's uh, it's funny now. But um, I um, I I have things in all of that that inspire me. I think about like what do I go back to? I have to say, for movies, books, music. It is all just joy. I have a uh, teenage kids and my daughter is like so into 90s rock. Like we listen <laughs> to um, Liz Fair and Dinosaur Jr. and all these bands. And I have to say all that music inspires me because it gave me joy in the time and it still gives me joy. And I you know, I worked in the music business. I worked in the music business because I loved music and I'm mm -hmm. not a particularly good musician. And I, I feel like music is so much fun. So I love, there's this Liz Fair song called The Divorce Song, which <laughs> it's not a particularly happy song, but it's like, I know every word and I love singing it at the top of my lungs. And I can call a friend of mine who I used to sing it with, you know, 25 years ago and be like, I just heard this song. And um, that's, you know, I find that inspiring. Like that, that, that music can just take you right back to someplace you were ages yeah. ago. Well, we're gonna have to have you sing that and uh, had a bad day, <laughs> but both of those at some point. Um, exactly. I'm curious, other than your family and maybe even other than music, where do you find joy outside of work? Um, I cook a lot. I um, am a, a very, I was, I, I'm a, a, I don't know, prolific. I don't know the adjective to use. I cook a lot, um, mm. mostly on the weekends. I, I really like it. I like experimenting. Um, it's just, I don't know, there's something about spending a couple hours like, 
chopping and sauteing and creating and then like eating it that I find incredibly rewarding. Um, so are your I kids do that. adventurous? Are your kids adventurous eaters now? Yes, yes, they will. Great. They're pretty good at trying anything. They have some things they won't eat, but they're they're pretty good about uh, about trying uh, trying anything. And uh, uh, you know, as, as when they're like, "Oh, this isn't good," I'm like, "You know, you can't produce a hit every time." Yeah, right. Yeah. Like, do you want to start cooking? No, great. So I think it's fun, and I love doing things like. Let's see if we can eat vegetarian for a week or whatever. I don't know. Does that sound like a release or more work? But I find it relaxing. Absolutely. Well, uh, that, I love that. That's a, that's such a good outlet for for many reasons. Um, so I guess my last question is: If is there a, a brand that you've never worked on that you've always admired, and what do you admire about that brand? Um, I sort of have a boring answer to this, but. Um, I love the Target brand. I think it Thanks. is um, so consistent about who they are, what they are. It's simple, right? It's so simple. It's red and white. It's the bullseye. It's occasionally that dog. Yeah. Um, and very clear about what they're offering to the customer and why. And, and, and don't really try to be more or less than they are. And um, I don't know, I find comfort in that, um, in that consistency. That's great. Well, and they've, they've really found, I think their niche in terms of, you know, they're not Walmart and they're not a high-end department store. They've really found that middle ground, which is, you know, a little bit fancier, but for an affordable price. Correct. But, and they're also <clears throat> not Amazon. Mm-hmm. And I definitely find like as things shift to Amazon, I still have the stuff I'm always going to get at Target that I'm more comfortable getting at Target. I know it's going to be there. I know it's not going to explode in the box. I know it's not, you know, and I know if there's an issue, I'm just going to walk it back in and they're going to. So it's, yeah. I, I do, it's like this huge brand, but it's weird to say they've found a niche, but you're exactly right. They're, they're not really Walmart. They're not really Amazon. They they fit right in that life, that part of my life. I want them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, if you think about all of the aspects of your life where they can solve problems for you, I mean, I think about every birthday gift that I've ever bought for my kids' birthday parties or for their friends' birthday parties has always come from there. Yes. And, uh, you know, there's certain parts of, of your life that they just solve problems for. So I, I understand the, the love of that brand. Yes, exactly. Well, exactly. Well, Laura Goldberg, the Chief Marketing and Revenue Officer for Constant Contact, this has been such a joy to talk to you. Thank you so much. Thank you. It's been really fun.